McClellan, and I'm a woman at I'm the Iowa. chief curator at the University Hi, of I'm Iowa Marin, Museum I'm of Art, and I'm a woman at Iowa. Shishiji Durham, I'm an associate professor in the School of Journalism, and I'm a woman at Iowa. Welcome. My name is Carissa Haugeberg, and this is Women at Iowa, a show that documents the experiences and history of women at the University of Iowa. I'm pleased to welcome our guest, Jean Martin, who was a 20-year uh, steward with AFSME Local 12 while she worked at Motor Pool at the University of Iowa. Thank you, Jean Martin, for joining us today. You're welcome. Um, let's begin by talking about where you were raised. I was born and raised in Chicago, a suburb of Chicago, Wheaton, mm -hmm. Illinois. And I had a very nuclear upbringing there with my family. Okay. And um, were your parents college educated? Both my parents are college educated, um, consummate volunteers. I think this is where I get that particular part of my culture. Um, they were very strong. DuPage County Republicans, and I remember that well, mm -hmm. and I think you're influenced by that no matter where you go. Mm -hmm. so. so you had to learn early on, uh, you probably had them in the back of your mind when you thought about how to approach people who thought differently from you. I think I did. Yeah. I know I did. Um, mm -hmm. And what were your parents' professions? My father was an insurance salesman, and my mother was a housekeeper until I went to college, mm -hmm. and then she went to work. Okay. So they were not involved in union organizing? No, not at all. Okay. Um, why did you move to Iowa City in 1959? I came here as a college freshman. My sister had graduated in 1959 from the U. Mm -hmm. And I applied for school here and was accepted and thought I liked it a lot. Okay. You liked the town? and I did at the time. I still do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's really interesting about your experience as a college student at the University of Iowa is that you had a child, a small child. And I think that many students today don't think about that, about how many college students had young families mm -hmm. when they came to the university. How did you balance that? How did you go to class and raise a child? And the, I married after two years of school. And in the first year of my marriage, I had my first daughter. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go to school right away. She was about a year old. And mm -hmm. then I started Saturday and evening classes. Mm -hmm. And that works if you have a spouse at home mm -hmm. to watch that child or, or a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. OK. And so the university was offering Saturday and evening classes? In even the then. OK. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and would you say that a majority of your peers were like you, had families at home? And that's why they were taking that's those? That's all I knew at the time. Uh -huh. were Folks that were married, I did know some young, younger folks that went to school, but many of my friends were married okay. with children. And um, how did you um, work out child care? It was usually a reciprocity thing. Mm -hmm. Often there was very, very rarely was money exchanged back in the mm -hmm. 60s. It was often a, a sweat equity thing where you would do something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's how I got my kids into preschool was by doing maintenance work around the buildings and yard work and things like that and that would include child care. Okay. And there's the all it's usually a cooperative effort. Okay. So just to clarify, you might drop off your child for 2 hours, but then in exchange you would be expected to provide 2 hours of Frequently. labor Frequently either that was the case. watching kids or doing maintenance as you mentioned right. or okay. Mm -hmm. Um could you describe what it was like to be a college student? Did you thrive in an academic setting? Did you enjoy your classes? Um, I went to Kirkwood um, a lot. And I enjoyed Kirkwood because the Saturday evening classes frequently had people my age. Uh -huh. But it was, there was not such a stretch. Uh -huh. There's not that big a disparity in age between a returning student. I mean, mm -hmm. I was in my mid-20s, mm -hmm. so that's not so bad. And one thing that you've mentioned to me previously was that you just didn't feel stimulated in your academic coursework. Um, Not at all, no. And I think that that's really interesting because I think we often think of there being outlets for men who don't thrive in academic settings, that they can go to a trade school or mm -hmm. a two-year school, that there are these alternatives, that there's an understanding that not everyone thrives. And it, it's not related to intellect. It's just what your interests are, what your aptitude is. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't think about that when it comes to women. And so They didn't at that time. Yeah. No, not yeah. at all. 
Okay. Um, so why did you take a job with the university? I had been, um, I s just had the one daughter, and she was a early preteen, and I hadn't been working at a place that offered benefits, and, and I was approached mm -hmm. to come to work for the university and thought maybe that might be a good idea. Okay, good, and why were you good attracted steady to work? motor pool in particular? That was it. That, okay. was, that was where the opportunity was. Okay, so it was a very pragmatic decision. You needed benefits, yeah. a full-time job, and one, a job opened up. Yep. Okay. Um, and can you describe what your colleagues were like when you first entered your job? And what year was that that you started working at the motor it's pool? It's about 1974. 1974. Okay, so what so was it like when you showed up to work in 1974 at motor pool? I, I think that, that I was just largely ignored, mm -hmm. but I was had a standalone job. I wasn't working in the shop. I was working outside of the shop at the gas pumps. Okay. And I think my colleagues generally accepted me because I was a, a viable employee, but I don't think they had any personal regard for mm -hmm. me in any fashion at that time. And were there other women working at the motor pool? Just the in time? the offices. Okay, so as uh, clerical staff? And yeah. Okay. So I was the only woman in the blue collar part of the business. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting that you stood outside filling vehicles, so you came into contact with people from throughout the university who were stopping by to fill up vehicles and literally hundreds okay yeah. that's yeah, interesting it was, real, it was very nice uh-huh okay um how did you become aware of the union asked me local 12 right there at the job okay right there on the pumps okay yeah i was approached by a, a union member and he said he knew i was a new employee and he mm -hmm. asked me if i'd be interested in joining and mm -hmm. I thought that's that'd be interesting to pursue that. Mm -hmm. I really didn't know what it was all about, uh -huh. but I did learn. And over time. have you reflected on why you were so willing to join, considering your upbringing, which doesn't sound like you had a union? I don't th think that that was an issue at the time. Uh -huh. For me, it was a a way to meet people. Okay. And I really admired this gentleman who had asked me to join. Uh huh. And and after I did join and, and went to the meetings, I learned a lot. Uh huh. And it becomes a social outlet. Yeah. And I had uh, my political leaning was moving more to the left all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you shared a kinship or a personality Indeed. trait with, yeah, I did. with other people who were members of this union. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you served for 20 years as a union steward. And just for members of our audience who don't know what that means, what does a union steward do? They represent the employees. Uh -huh. And since this is a right to work state, we are obliged under the contract to represent everyone. Mm -hmm. And while I didn't file any grievances specifically, I did a lot of mediating mm -hmm. and, and intervening on behalf of my employees with management. So we would settle things outside of the grievance process, typically. Mm -hmm. And because I was the designated steward, there is a regard given that individual in most uh, work units. Mm -hmm and you're allowed to speak on behalf of the employees if, if the employees give you that permission. Okay. So I did quite a bit of that, and it was very helpful, mm -hmm. very helpful. Well, I, I wonder if many members of our audience understand how complicated um, ideas about labor can be, that there are some people who believe that we should always fight for higher salaries, and there are other people who believe that we should fight for benefits. Yeah. There are some people who are very supportive of going on strike and really asserting workers' rights, and there are others who are more fond of mediation and arbitration. Can you talk about what your thoughts are on, um, on those At issues? the time I was active from the late 70s through the 80s and early 90s, the culture was to go for grievance handling almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. When it came time to bargaining the contracts, the the people that were elected to do that were to go after more money, higher wages. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 or 15 years, there's been more protection of benefits so that there's no erosion for health care, uh, little or no re erosion for retirement benefits, which the university is really famous for. Mm -hmm. um, and my particular bent was to mediate rather than file grievances mm -hmm. and I I worked at it and even had a small amount of mediation training mm -hmm. but I'm not so sure that that helped me as much as probably my female perspective in an all-male shop mm -hmm. 
I was a mother figure for a lot of the employees mm -hmm. and or if not a sister figure and had a lot of crying on the shoulders uh -huh. a lot of that and if you had to if you had a, a young employee who was ready to fight and really wanted to walk out on the job and have a, a you know a strike or something like that how is it that you would speak to that young employee to try to convince them that mediation might be a more effective tool strictly speaking that really really doesn't happen mm -hmm. as a public employee we're not allowed to strike right. and when it came time for issues like that uh, frequently we would address them with if you hope to stay in this job and you're planning on making a career of it don't go for the wage increases as much as the retention of benefits because one day you're going to retire one mm -hmm. day you're going to have this accrued pot of health care benefits and you're going to need them mm -hmm. you're not always going to be 35 or 40 years old and mm -hmm. you're not always going to feel like doing your job mm -hmm. and in the end it the rewards are there. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I'm one of them because I did retire after 35 years, but the employees that, that would see my point of view were, were grateful in the end. I've had mm -hmm. two of them come back to me and say, thank you, because I needed all that accrued health care because right. I had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And they just don't see that when they're 40 years old. Absolutely, that it's a, a, yeah. an experience uh, that when you're young, you think about salary first. And exactly. It, it takes time to think about how important those benefits are. Yep. That's interesting. Okay. Um, what were some of the initiatives that you worked on as a member of AFSME? And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of that pre-vocational training program right. that you worked on. We had a, there was a, a woman on campus, she was the director of the Women's Resource and Action Center, her name is Sue Buckley, and she's currently the HR vice president, and she applied for a grant and, and um, got the physical plant and the university to each pay half of her salary. Mm -hmm. Central administration paid one half and physical plant paid the other half of her mm -hmm. salary as director of a pre-vocational training program which brought women and people of color into the university for training prior to applying for apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. So things like math, physical education and conditioning, um, a lot of cultural issues, and at the end of their program, which was typically, I think, a couple of months long, mm -hmm. they would tour the work sites mm -hmm. and see what those job opportunities might look like and, and shadow some of the employees. Mm -hmm. And in the motor pool, we typically had them come through. We would have one or two per training session mm -hmm. that would want to see what the mechanics did. And correct me if I'm wrong, but anecdotally, I've gotten the impression that um, the university prior to the 1970s was in many ways a good old boys club that right. um, a guy might work in maintenance and have a friend whose son needed a job, and he would set him up with a job, and that it was sort of a... Uh, who you know sort of a system that got people jobs. Yeah, not uncommon. And so as a result, the, f the flair of these jobs tended to be white and male, just because that was who they knew, that was Indeed. their neighbors, that was their circle of friends, and there was no incentive to really open it up because they didn't know Joe Smith and they didn't know Sally Jones. And so that was what you were trying to break open mm -hmm. in the 1970s was to enable more people to get into the system. Is that? Well, it was in the 70s that comparable worth was codified in the state legislature because women and men were paid dis mm -hmm. disparately. And during that time, I mean, women's issues were coming to the forefront mm -hmm. and the discrimination issues were, were way more prominent mm -hmm. politically and at least in the print media. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a part of that, mm -hmm. and while I may have felt like I was discriminated against, it, it was changing as it was happening, mm -hmm. and you felt that change. Mm -hmm. And so with this pre-vocational training program, women could apply to, to this program, and they would be taken around the university, is that correct, into different positions? And at the end of their training. Okay. At the end of their their. The program uh -huh. had a structure prior to the, the job shadowing. Uh -huh. Yeah, and at the end they were taken around to see what the kind of jobs they could be applying for. Okay. 
and the and the and the private sector was also represented in this program. So that's where the the apprenticeships were. And would you say that it was mutually beneficial? Not only that women could say, could get into these jobs maybe for a week or two and say, oh, hey, I, c I could be a painter at the university, but that then other men could see women doing this job and see that they were doing perfectly right. good work yeah. and that it wasn't that did totally happen. disruptive to the culture to have a woman working alongside them, that, that it was mutually happen, yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Um, at one point um, in your career at the university, you were a whistleblower. Could you describe what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, I was running the parts room, um, moved from the gas pumps to the parts room as a job promotion. And over time, it, was, it had become apparent to the clerical account clerk that there might be some embezzling going on. And we collected our evidence. And I went to Mary Jo Small, who was at the time the Vice President for Finance and University Services and asked her advice and she said sure and she contacted the director of the physical plant and he said sure and so they presented a case and the three individuals that were being investigated all lost their jobs but the union went to bat for one of the people that was prosecuted and actually got his job back. And just to be clear, at the time that he was accused of embezzling, he was not a member of the union. No, he wasn't. But he joined the union but after the accusation was made, and why? He was, they're encouraged, people are encouraged when they're represented in a big case to join because there's such a huge expense involved. Mm -hmm. But he was ironically paired up in his new position as a facilities mechanic with the president of the local. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody that was going to persuade this gentleman to join the union, it would be this man. Uh -huh. And I'm sure that's how it all came about. Because you don't have to join to be represented, but uh -huh. it's a, I think it's a politically correct thing to do at the time. Mm -hmm. And you had to personally gather a lot of evidence with other people, didn't you? We, we did. Uh -huh. We did. And, and it, be, it was proved to be circumstantial, but the two other individuals confessed to their malfeasance and that was a no-brainer right there. Mm -hmm. So that happened. And what were the long-term ramifications of getting rid of the embezzlers? What happens is, I think in a workplace, a whistleblower is typically not well regarded. And in my case, it was kept um, my name and, and what I had done was kept from the employees. It was done through a different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And while everybody knew that the account clerk and I had opened up this case, um, they tended to side with their fellow employees, the people that they had been working with for years and years and years, rather than the new person on the block mm -hmm. and who was maybe being an interloper mm -hmm. in and, and messing up their culture. Mm -hmm. But those people eventually leave also. So I outlived them and mm -hmm. saw a whole new um, workforce come into the motor pool, newer and younger and enlightened people. Mm -hmm. And what year did this happen, the whistleblowing? It was in the early 80s. Okay. And so you had a, a generation of guys who, for lack of a better phrase, were part of this kind of good old boys network. All right that they'd probably started working in the 60s, you know, prior to yeah. the university really opening up jobs to other people. So again, and the, and the shop was non-unionized. So that uh -huh. was that went against me right away. Uh -huh. Even though I wasn't a a really vocal union member, mm -hmm. I did manage to sign up a couple of people, but largely they were very dismissive of the union mm -hmm. and just figured that they'd take care of themselves. And so after those individuals left, resigned, were fired, a new, I would assume, a new generation of people right. were put in to fill those jobs. And can you describe the, the difference between the new? Typically, um, they would come in wanting the higher wages. And after I had a chance to visit with them mm -hmm. and use some of my experience on them, they would see the wisdom of hanging in there with the contracts and, and not being 
so interested in more wages as just the retention of benefits. I, there were not grievances so much coming out of my work area. We, we got along with management. The guys were towing the line. They had come from a private sector work environment, and, and two or three of them embraced the union concept mm -hmm. right away. I didn't even, I didn't even really have to ask them. Mm -hmm. They came to me and wanted to sign up. And do you think that it was because it was a new generation of men in that? I think a lot of that had to do with it, but they were also, um, the union was, was very strong back uh -huh. in the 80s and, and in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And it was very visible on campus, especially in the physical plant. Mm -hmm. And they weren't activist union members, but they never complained mm -hmm. about paying their dues, ever. It was clear that what the benefits of belonging to a union were exactly. at the time. Okay. Exactly. Um, would you identify yourself as a feminist? I, yes. Okay. And, and how so? Um, only that I really believe in the, the um, support that we need to give women uh, politically and culturally. Mm -hmm. And I, I work for that effort, but it's not exclusive. Mm -hmm. I um, have seen so many changes in my adult life, mm -hmm. all the way from no-fault divorce through comparable worth and and those kinds of issues and so it just it influences you mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's where it all came from I just didn't jump right into it yesterday it's been gathering in me and for the last 40 years mm -hmm. yeah you seem to, to have a real firm commitment to social justice yeah that, seems that to part really is very strong uh -huh. in me right now uh-huh yeah um, Throughout your life, you've been involved in a number of organizations in a volunteer capacity, apart from the university. Um, and for example, you helped to found the New Pioneer Co-op. Mm -hmm. You've been active in Girl Scouts. Could you describe some of your volunteer work and what you do? Currently, what I do now is um, I'm still active with the labor movement as a retiree and still dues-paying member of AFSCME Local 12. And I'm on the board of the Iowa City Federation of Labor. So we do grassroots politics and support the, the candidates, not just locally, but the, the state legislature and the, and the state senate for our district. And so we, we represent people that are favorable to labor issues. Mm -hmm. And they go so through a screening process. I'm very active in the uh, Johnson County Senior Center. And I'm on their commission. And I do programming. and volunteer work in the center mm -hmm. and go to a lot of classes there so it's become a second home for me. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned to me that you're more comfortable doing more of the behind the scenes work mm -hmm. um, rather than being a spokesperson or being the person who signs people up for the union or right. you know gets people to pledge to volunteer X number of hours. Um, can you describe some of the work? I think that a lot of people who don't volunteer much don't really understand how much work gets put upon the shoulders of people who do step up to bat? Probably um, one of the one of the most interesting experiences I had over a period of about ten years was before the the yard signs for the candidates would become standardized, made out of plastic and cardboard. We used to hand make them, mm -hmm. and we would make these gigantic billboard signs for the for the the candidates who are running for governor, even and place them around this southeastern part of the state. And I used to work with two or three people and we would spend an entire summer making these gigantic signs out of plywood and then erecting them, then mm -hmm. taking them down. And we would do this session after session. Mm -hmm. It was a hoot, uh -huh. but it was for the young. It just, it couldn't happen now, but it's done differently now, but we would make these incredibly colorful, enormous signs that uh -huh. we would place around the county. Uh -huh. We still talk about it. Uh -huh. yeah. And I would imagine that there was a social component to it. Like oh, that's yeah. maybe what kept you going sure. and kept you showing up every weekend. Sure, and lots of beer and pizza. Uh -huh. yeah. um, um, can you describe what it was like to found the new Pioneer Co-op and what that process was that like? That was actually, um, I'm not specifically a founder, but I uh -huh. was in on the, the dirt floor on Bowery Street. There was a place over the women's press, which was on the corner up the street from them in what is the Vine Building now. Mm -hmm. We were on the second floor, and the women's press was in there, and they moved up to Bowery and eventually moved over to Van Buren. And I, I've been a working member there for over 30 years, so I continued to do that. And 
that allows me to shop more freely mm -hmm. and and then gives me some extra money to buy their good products. Right. And I really mm -hmm. enjoy that work as well. Mm -hmm. Some of our viewers aren't from Iowa City, so let's yeah. explain that to them. What does a what is a working member? A working of the member company? gets a thirty percent discount and you work typically I work uh, twenty hours a month uh -huh. and I do the recycling. Okay. So my job is to make sure I get all the cans, office paper, newspaper, and plastic out of a space that's provided for that, for the okay. store. The cardboard all goes into a compactor, but my volunteer commitment is just keep this thing going mm -hmm. and keep it clean. And so people can, uh, members can take on a variety of tasks. Some people maybe bag fruit, dried they fruit. They do, yes. Some people work the cash register. Some yes. people bag groceries, but the idea is that this volunteer labor then saves the co-op money, and then Indeed. in exchange you get a discount rather than getting paid for your labor, right? Right. Okay. Um, and what sorts of work have you done f with the Girl Scouts? That was when my kids were young, okay. and I did another, it was just behind the scenes. I was never mm -hmm. a leader, but I would provide transportation and moral support, and oh. we had lots of camping equipment, so that was thrown into mm -hmm. the mix go to the meetings, encourage my kids to, s to keep up with it. And both my girls did it through high school. Uh -huh. But I think it was because there was leadership for them, not just the mentoring from their mom. Uh -huh. So that part was always very rewarding, uh -huh. especially for my kids. Uh -huh. And you've always been very committed to issues related to the environment. Um, I do. And mm -hmm. have you always recycled, for example? or whatever, not how? I think the, the initiative started back in the late 70s mm -hmm. there was no recycling in Johnson County and it started out with a grade school kids collecting milk jugs mm -hmm. in bins provided at the junior highs and mm -hmm. the grade schools and that's how it started mm -hmm. it was a grassroots effort and I think a lot of us jumped on and at the time that started uh, the group I currently belong to which is environmental advocates mm -hmm. supported that mm -hmm. and the group grew out of that and and we are currently involved in just local efforts mm -hmm. like rummage on the ramp and we with our funds generate grants to people that are interested in doing environmental projects and we typically give away a couple thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. in grants and are there any major initiatives that that group is particularly interested in right now the ones that come to mind are um, the last grant that was provided was for an environmental film festival mm -hmm. that ran here last summer, and I think it's it's coming together again for some of this summer. We did the Sustainable Iowa City, mm -hmm. and the gentleman who started that applied for a grant from us. The uh, it it's more than that, mm -hmm. but that comes to mind right now. Mm -hmm. One thing that I find to be so fascinating about your life is that, you know, you you weren't as interested in university life. You weren't as interested in your university classes. You didn't feel fulfilled or stimulated by them. And you were able to get in at Motor Pool and have this, this career trajectory that is not typical for women, or wasn't at the time. Right. Yet you have this very active intellectual life. You, you know, volunteer in a variety of facets. You're, you read, you volunteer. And I wonder to what degree that is due to the feminist movement, that you were able to keep one foot in a job that kept you with good benefits, a good salary, something you found interesting, and yet another foot planted in the arts and in the community mm -hmm. and keeping that part of your, your mind fulfilled. I think some of that began when I was asked to sit on the advisory board of the Women's Center and I met Sue Buckley who was the director at the time and she just ran a really tight ship mm -hmm. and I was not familiar with committee work and I learn, you learn because it's an activist board and then Mary Jo Small asked me if I'd like a seat on the Council on the Status of Women because they needed someone from the blue collar units, staff people on the council and I applied for that and was on the council for many years mm -hmm. and really enjoyed that work and you learn that it's your participation that brings the benefits mm -hmm. and if you don't participate you don't see those rewards so the reward is actually in the work. 
Okay, and just to clarify for our audience, um, the Women's Center is now, we refer to that as RAC, the Women's Resource and Action Council or Center. Center. Center, okay. So Women's Center is the precursor to RAC. Um, and then the UI Council on the Status of Women is a separate function, or is a separate entity within the University of Iowa, and they come out with reports on women and wages, um, mm -hmm. looking at women getting promotions within the university. And so you were involved in both. Mm -hmm. And for all of your work, you eventually won the Jean Jew Award um, for right. your commitment to, to supporting women, to being an advocate for women on campus. Um, and that's, that's quite an honor to have, to have received that. That was a blast. Yeah. Yep. Um, one question that we always ask of our guests is for you to recommend a book that has inspired you or sustained okay. you or one that you would recommend to our audience. What book would you? So the book that I'm currently reading is The People's History of the United States, which is sort of a reread. This was published in the 70s, and it's been updated by the author prior mm -hmm. to his death through the Clinton administration, which is a, a rewriting and a reinterpretation of everything that was left out of the history books mm -hmm. about the oppression uh, of the American Indians and the, and the African American, the lack of information in our history books. So this is, this is the best. Mm -hmm. so and at the time that it came out, it was really quite stunning for a lot of people because yeah. I think uh, many members of our audience probably recall their own high school history classes, which were a series of studying wars and presidents and an assumption that that was real history. And exactly. Howard Zinn kind of turned that on its head. And yeah, so, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, and, and provided a social history. What is it like for ordinary citizens it's struggling very revealing. through the New yeah. Deal? And, yeah. and to this day, it's still not in the books. Mm -hmm. So this is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. it's, a, and it's, it's an appropriate choice for you to bring that book yeah. in. To, it's, it's very nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You've had a, a fascinating career in volunteer history, and uh, Johnson County and the state of Iowa have been yeah. beneficiaries of your work. So, thank you. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. And once again, I'm Carissa Haugerberg, and this has been another episode of Women at Iowa. Thank you.